one. Okay. Welcome to number theory. All right. So this is math 313. What's really nice about a class like this is there are no courses at Williams which directly have this as a prereq. What this means is we have enormous flexibility in terms of what material we look at. Now, not surprisingly, the material will be related to number theory. There is a very strong likelihood that there will be some advanced number theory classes offered next year, in which case this class will definitely do enough to be... Is it recording? Yeah, just a little bit. The screen is faint. I think oh, here. Well. Okay. But, yeah, that helps. Okay, there you go. So any of the classes next year, this will be more than enough to prepare you for. You know, if you are interested in graduate school and stuff like that, this would prepare you for classes like that. If you are just curious about mathematics, one of the things that's really nice about number theory is a lot of the problems are very easy to state. You can talk to them, to elementary school kids about them. And professional mathematicians and elementary school kids have about equally good things to say about a lot of these elementary problems. They have resisted analysis for, in some places, millennia. And we sometimes have ideas and we have partial results. And so a big part of the course is going to be talking about how to ask questions. So we have to start today with the boring stuff of the mechanics. I will then probably do something that most of you have seen, but I'll try to do it with a twist. All right. This is a small class, at least for Williams in math, which is wonderful. I would love there to be a lot of class participation. If there are things you want to see, and this is why I asked you, let me know what you're interested in, great chance we will be able to work into the class. All right. So obviously, one of the objectives is to learn number theory. As I was saying, I want to emphasize the techniques and asking the right questions. When I was a graduate student at Princeton, I was teaching a research class, and I had written up a set of notes for my students on something called Benford's Law and how it applied to the Fibonacci numbers. And then a year or two later, I found out that almost identical to my notes was a published paper written a year before I was born. I did not plagiarize it, but as soon as you ask the question, are the Fibonacci numbers Benford, whatever that means, if you have the same kind of training as everyone else, there's a natural progression of things to try. And so a lot of you, you're gaining technical skills. This is great. Technical skills are important. But more important than that is curiosity, is asking the right questions, is exploring. And that's often where the difficult stuff is. That's often where the real challenges, the real work is, is figuring out what should you look at. And once you ask the right question, it's often clear how to proceed. Other times we have no idea. But in many problems, the hardest part is asking the right question. Sometimes the question we ask is too hard, in which case we step back and ask, is there an easier question we could ask? Is there an easier case we could look at and build some intuition and get a sense of what's going on? There will be a lot of using computers in this class to build intuition. Computers are absolutely wonderful. If you just know some basic for loops, if you know some if statements, there's a lot of investigations you can do. I am happy to have a course day devoted to you know, writing computer code. It is a very useful skill. It's one of the two most useful skills former students tell me uh, after they've left and gone into either the real world or academia. The other is the ability to present and speak in public. And so I really want to make sure you take advantage of stuff like this. Because we can write computer codes, there's a lot of things we can simulate and build intuition, get a sense of what the right answer is, and use that to help. Unfortunately, sometimes the computers can mislead. Sometimes it takes a while before the limiting behavior sets in. And if you look at small cases, uh, which we were doing in a, uh, the problem solving class I was teaching earlier today, you could be misled as to what's happening. So it's not a complete boon, but it's more good than harm. I mostly program in Mathematica now because, one, I'm lazy, and two, that's what I used when I was an undergraduate at Yale, and so I've gotten very familiar. It has a really nice library of functions built in. You can use any system you want, and I'm happy to talk with you. The difficulty, of course, is different languages have different syntax. It's the same idea, it's the same thought process, but it might be a brace in this one, a curly brace in this one, a bracket in this one. But the structure of how to attack it is going to be very similar. I also want to use these problems to see good math. And a lot of this is going to be related to things that you're interested in. You know, this class is small, it's under 20. If there's something you want to see, I'm happy to try to work it in. How many of you have seen cryptography before? Okay, not too many. So I will talk about how some of this basic number theory is what allows, you know, things like e-commerce to exist. You know, how are we able to create these systems to allow people to securely communicate? 
So this is you know, one of the most important applications. You know, the great mathematician Hadi, uh, on his deathbed, you know, he's writing a wonderful book called A Mathematician's Apology. And he says, well, you know, at least I can say that nothing I did in my life will have any impact for good or for ill on humanity. I've been completely useless. I've been a pure mathematician. And now in the 21st century, a lot of the pure mathematics he and other number theorists have done have found applications in cryptography, in cyber warfare, and stuff like that. You never know where things are going to lead to. And so what I love is we can take a lot of these problems and there's a lot of different routes we can go with them. All right. Course mechanics. So there'll be two midterms. Unless you tell me otherwise, I will drop your lowest midterm. All right. I'm having difficulty trying to find a situation where you would not want your lowest midterm dropped. If you can find one, please let me know. When I taught at Brown years ago, if you got an F in the course, it didn't show up on your transcript. So there, sometimes people would rather have a failing grade than a C. So I have had, I have had students in the past ask me to fail them. I've never had this happen at Williams. So I will drop your lowest midterm. Anyone can have a bad exam. The other thing is I don't expect everyone to get every point on every exam. Uh, the first semester, uh, so the first year I taught a senior seminar here, there were six questions. The last part of the last problem was open. It was just solved a couple of months ago. Most of the time I'm not going to have problems like that. But there will be some real challenging problems. And I'm not expecting you to get them all, but it's nice sometimes to test yourself against some really good things. Uh, final will be 35% homework, 15% class participation projects, 15%. If you want, you can do an intense project and really delve deep into something, try to control your education. And if you do that, I will then rescale so that everything else counts as 90% and that counts as 10%. You know, the project has to be sizable and significant. But if you want to go that route, I'm happy to adjust the course so you can pursue something in greater detail. Uh, the prerequisites for this course is linear algebra. If you know some programming, that's great, but I'm happy to teach you the programming you need. If I'm in my office, it's office hours. One of the things that's nice about this current building is that we have the library and we have our offices all around it. This is deliberately designed so that you see us when we come to our offices. I know somebody here saw me yesterday and came by and we had a nice conversation for on the order of 20 minutes on everything from mathematics to Supergirl. Welcome. So we're just going through the course mechanics right now. Here you go. So please, you know, come by and see and uh, chat. So if I'm in my office, it's office hours. If there is an issue you want to talk to me about privately, you can email me anonymously using eavesmath at gmail.com. The password is 1793 Williams. All I ask is that you don't change the password. It doesn't have to be an issue with this class. It could be an issue with the department. It could be something at Williams. If there's just some information you want to get out there, here's a way to do so anonymously. Uh, because I'm recording these lectures, there are certain stories I cannot tell in full detail when the camera's rolling. I'm happy to add additional details before or after class. At one institution I was teaching at, one day three students came to my office and closed the door so I knew something was wrong. The professor was teaching the wrong course. He had prepared the wrong course over the summer. He was teaching the SQL course. And when told about this, he said, well, how much of the prerequisites do you really need? I'll teach you that whole course in one week. So you can imagine how much of a train wreck that was. So this is just a way so that if you see something going on, you know, here's a way to provide feedback and get it to the people who need to know. All right. Web page for the course. If you haven't gotten an email from me, I think I've sent two emails, one a few days ago and one around four in the morning today. If you did not get an email from me, that means you're not on the course email list. So email me sjm1 and I will add you to the course email list. Uh, there are numerous handouts, additional comments from each day. This is just, if you want to look at the material a little bit further, here's just a way to follow up and here's some additional things to look at. So there are a lot of things you can look at with number theory. And the idea of the additional comments is to give you a kind of directed reading for if something really piqued your interest today, what else could you look at? There's an opportunity to help write a book. So the textbook we're using for this course is actually written by a colleague of mine. I've known him since he was a grad student at Brown and I was a postdoc there. And you know, this is the you know, first time this book is being used outside his home institution. So this is a great opportunity to provide feedback. If there are parts of the text that are particularly good, that are unclear, if there are problems that are exciting, 
If there are explanations that should be more detailed to you, please let us know. If there's material that seemed to be missing, gee, you know, you had done X, Y, I was kind of expecting Z to come after Y, you know, please let us know. The last is prepare for class. So it's extremely important that you read what I ask you to read beforehand so that we don't have to spend time in class going through all these definitions and whatnot. I don't know about you, I know for me, I have trouble processing math in real time. And to sit down and learn definitions and be writing this down while a lecture is going on is extremely hard. This does not mean if my kids get sick and I can't come into school that one of you is able to come up and give the lecture. You don't need to be that prepared for class. But you should have a rough idea of what it's on. So for instance, uh, maybe we're doing Sterling's formula. You should know what Sterling's formula is, what it's being used for, maybe an idea of what goes in the proof, but not necessarily all the details. Uh, this is, I think, the place where I always ask students to vote on what they want the cell phone policy to be. So there's two options for the cell phone policy. Option one, if your cell phone goes off, it's a warning to the class. Second time someone's cell phone goes off in the semester, I flip a coin, and if it's heads, everybody has a pop quiz. Third time, I don't even bother flipping the coin, everybody has a pop quiz. And if you're not in class that day, you get a zero. Option B, if your cell phone goes off, you're responsible you're responsible for providing munchkins and grapes and stuff like that as breakfast to everybody. How many people want option B? Okay. So I don't even have to ask about option A. Option A is clearly outvoted. Okay. So my cell phone number is 617-835-3982. You are welcome to try to have one of your friends call me during class to see if my phone is on. I often leave my phone in my office just to make sure that this does not happen. If you are expecting an important call, you know, a job, someone is sick, do not have your phone on silence. Just tell me I'm expecting an important call today. All right. Uh, some advice from my brother. First one is party less than the person next to you. I think everybody is sitting next to somebody today, unlike the first class, so at least everybody has a choice. Take advantage of office hours and mentoring. When you leave Williams, you are not going to have the same opportunities for people to engage you. What I like to tell my advisees is try to get to know at least one professor well each semester. I'm happy for that to be me, happy for it to be someone else. This way when you graduate, you will have three or four people, if you're only 50% successful, who will know you well enough to write a letter, or who will know you well enough to have eyes and ears open about opportunities that might fit you. One of the big opportunities I got in grad school was because I got to know my advisor well, and I was not his best graduate student in terms of theory, but he knew I knew coding. And he had a really good opportunity with a grant, but he needed somebody who could do coding. And you know, that opportunity completely changed my life, got me heavily involved in undergraduate research. So really try to get to know at least one professor well each semester. The last is learn to manage your time well. This is extremely important. If you get an email, you should respond to the email if a response is required within 24 hours. This could be something short saying, I'm slammed right now, I'll get back to this in a week. But you want to let people know that you've gotten the message, it's in your box, it's in your process, you're going to get to it. It is amazing how many people do not do stuff like this and how much of an advantage you can get in life if you are just responsible and people know they can count on you to do things. Uh, related to this, which my brother hasn't included in his three pieces of advice, but he agrees is good, have good file names. Don't send me something called paper.pdf or cv or resume.pdf. It should have your last name in it. It should have some kind of descriptive label. Otherwise, it's a recipe to be lost in all the other stuff that's coming in that's similarly named. I have known Williams alums who are now moving up the corporate ladder who have gotten resumes from Williams students or other people, and if they want to forward it to their boss, if it's you know, resume.pdf, they would have to download it to the system first, rename the file, upload it, and then send the message as opposed to just click forward. And they're so busy and they're running around, they often say, ah, this person was borderline, it's not worth doing all this. And I sadly know people who have missed out on stuff like this. I know people who have missed out on government grants because it says it's a two-page maximum, and when they recompiled, they didn't notice it went over by one line, and the system didn't say it was over, accepted it, and they were automatically rejected. I know people who, there were server issues, and they didn't upload things until two minutes after midnight, or try to serve a wood and take it. Really manage things. Don't leave things to the last minute. I'm not sure if the next line has it. Yes. 
Uh, I'm happy to do practice interviews for people who are on the job market. I'm also happy to adjust deadlines. If you have a big meet coming up, if you have a big job interview coming up, that's more important than a problem set. Let me know and I'm happy to adjust when things are due. But you have to let me know at least a day in advance. If you let me know less than a day, that's not enough time. But if you know something big is coming up, if you have a feeling, hey, Professor Miller, this might be a really busy week. I'm going to try to get the homework done in time, but I might need an extension. Is that okay? Absolutely. You just let me know in plenty of time. Okay. Any other questions on the mechanics? We are almost done with the boring stuff. All right. Last is just a bunch of useful links. So templates for LaTeX, for papers, talks, posters, a Mathematica tutorial with videos. You know, this is all online. The secret to my web page is if there's any file I have that you like that's labeled .pdf, just change the PDF to .tex and you'll have the text source code. So if you want to see how something is done, that's how you get all the source files. Uh, there'll be a couple of handouts. Uh, these are just general handouts I've assembled over the years that are somewhat useful. And here's just a web page with just some general advice, you know, how to give a good talk, how to write a good paper, uh, you know, various things like this. You know, what is grad school like? Happy to talk about stuff like this in particular. Out of curiosity, how many of you are considering grad school? Okay. If you are considering grad school and you're not going to be a senior, I'm sorry, and you're not a senior right now, you should consider applying to small, that's the summer RU program we have here, as well as RU programs across the country. The deadline for our program is February 8th, so it's fast approaching. I am the program director this year. What that means is I am lucky enough to be in charge of the administration. It is not a task anybody wants, but like most things in life, you just rotate the hat among different people. But if you have any questions about the program in general or about what my group is doing, I'm happy to chat. If you have questions about what other groups are doing, I strongly urge you to talk to those professors. Okay. Any other questions on the mechanics? Okay, now we can finally start doing real math and doing the fun stuff. Okay. So this is a number theory class. What do you think is the very first thing we have to do? I'm sorry? Yeah, we should, we should really start with whole numbers, right? All right, so let's see. Let's, 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 let's swing around. And then I forgot to mention, I have an absolutely terrible memory. If you make any bad or wrong comments in class, I will not remember. I will sadly probably not remember the good comments either. So what I want everyone to do is when you make comments in class, even if you think it's a minor dinky comment, send me an email. And you're in the course... A uh, book that I have for this, I have a large column where I just keep track of all the comments people make. Sometimes a comment you think is really minor is actually major and it indicates a really good understanding of a subtle concept. When I'm writing letters of recommendation, the more comments I have from you, the more detailed letter I can write and have the letter be effective. So most of the time, a lot of students sadly don't have professors who know them well and they have a letter that basically just summarizes the transcript. Those letters have absolutely no impact. So speaking up in class, this is a great way for me to get to know you. This is a great way for me to be able to write a non-trivial letter. I'm also happy to meet with you for lunch, coffee, just come by my office. You know, this is uh, one of the nice things about being at a school like Williams. All right, good. All right, now it's swinging. Okay. So we start off with the numbers. So we have the natural numbers n. Oh, I forgot to turn. No, I did turn on the lights. Just half the lights are just dead. Okay. All right, so you'll let me know if I'm too much out of focus. So the natural numbers, it's questionable, thank you, it's questionable as to whether or not you consider zero a natural number. How do people feel? All right, we'll make zero a natural number. And then the whole numbers will not include zero. Zero, one, two, dot, dot, dot. We have the integers coming from the German Zahl, which is dot, 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 negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. We have the real number, well, we should do the rational numbers first. This is p over q. p and q are integers. q is not zero. We have the reals. We have the complex, which is the set of all x plus i, y. i is or i am the square root of negative one. And then for us, we have the big set called the primes. Can anybody give me the definition of a prime? Okay. How many people like this definition? A number is prime if it's divisible by only itself in. It says or, so you can have one over something. Right. So unfortunately, your definition allows one to be prime. 
And so you can define anything you want in mathematics. The question is, what is useful? And so it turns out it is extremely bad for one to be considered a prime. So prime, uh, p greater than or equal to 2, is prime if um, 1, p are the only divisors. One is a is the unit. All other positive numbers are composite. So they often use the example from chemistry. Think of the primes as your atoms, as your building blocks, and you build up numbers from the primes. And the idea is, if we understand the primes, hopefully we can understand things about numbers. We will do a lot of stuff with primes. Primes are incredibly important. They have phenomenal applications, including in cryptography, which was quite surprising at first. Yes? Do we consider negative 1 to be composite? So we would consider negative 1 also to be a unit. And this is why, so a very good comment, is I'm a little bit careful here that I'm only looking at the positives right now. I'm really only looking at the natural numbers. So 1 and negative 1 would be units. And then the question is, if we look at other systems of numbers, there could be more units. So for the integers, the only units are 1 and negative 1. But for other things, we could have um, what's called complex, root, complex roots of unity. So if you've seen things like this, e to the 2 pi i over 5, that would also be a unit. We're not going to go too much into that right now. Right now, I want to talk about primes, and I want to explain why we don't want 1 to be a prime. The reason is there's a theorem that I want. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic. You have not seen many fundamental theorems. We do not use that word loosely. You have to earn the status as fundamental. Okay? When you read a textbook, you have theorems galore. You have lemmas galore. Sometimes people are a little bit generous in what they're calling a theorem. And there's arguments, should this be a proposition, a lemma, or a theorem? But fundamental, how many fundamental <coughs> theorems do you know? Okay. <coughs> fundamental theorem of calculus, that's a great one. What else do we know? Yes? Uh, fundamental theorem of algebra. Fundamental theorem of algebra. A polynomial degree n with complex coefficients has exactly n roots. Any other fundamental theorems? Good. I hate the fundamental theorem of linear algebra. I think it's not appropriate to call that a fundamental theorem. I'm glad nobody wants to give it that status. Two. Right. Any seniors here? So that's it. In your entire career to date, you know two fundamental theorems? Okay, which one is that? Send me an email for that. I'm not sure if that one gets fundamental status. Yeah. A lot of it depends on who is writing the book. But e even if that, the number of fundamental themes we know is very small. We don't throw this around lightly. So the fundamental theme of arithmetic says any integer n greater than or equal to 2 is a unique product of prime powers in increasing order. So for example, if I give you 12, 12 would be 2 squared times 3. I could write this as 3 times 2 squared, or 2 times 3 times 2. I don't want to consider those different. Each number can be factored uniquely into a product of primes. If 1 was a prime, I could put in times 1 to the 2017, which is just absurd, right? And so we don't want 1 to be considered a prime, or we would no longer have unique decomposition. So because of that, it turns out to be extremely useful to say every number factors uniquely as a product of primes. So now, the first question you probably want to ask is, what can you say about the number of primes? So what kind of questions would you want to ask about primes? So it's, uh, you might have to do some work today. I don't know if it's tracking. Unit noun, that's your 
Yeah. No, yeah. It, when I have to use the back camera for the projector, it means it has tracking issues. All right. What kind of questions would you like to ask about primes? Are there infinitely many? So the first question, are there infinitely many? So one way to solve this is to write down infinitely many primes. Okay, that would fill up the entire semester and we would not, of course, reach infinity. Unless we find a formula for the primes. You, maybe we could find a formula for the nth prime. Or maybe we can find a formula for an infinite subset of primes. What other questions might you want to ask? Um, is there a ratio of Good. So question, how rapidly does the count go to infinity? And the way I'm writing this question, I'm assuming the answer to the first question is yes, there are infinitely many primes. So we use pi of x to denote the number of primes p less than or equal to x. Don't say the answer out loud. Does anybody know how rapidly the primes go to infinity? I'm not asking if you can prove it. Does anybody know the answer? Excellent. Good. So I don't have to worry about anybody shouting it out loud. All right. Yeah, thank you. All right. So claim 40% of all integers are prime and 20% start a twin prime pair that's numbers p, p plus 2, both prime. So I'm claiming in the limit 40% of all numbers are prime and 20% start a twin prime pair. Any thoughts on this claim? Seems unlikely. Seems unlikely. I think you want to use stronger language than that, but yes. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> I will, I'll prove it to you by computation. I will calculate all the primes up to 10. 2, 3, 5, 7. That's 40% of the numbers up to 10 are prime. And let's see, 3 starts a twin prime pair, and 5 starts a twin prime pair. QED. I have a few people look skeptical. Fine. I will calculate up to 20. Jeez. 11, 13. 17, the calculation's getting a little harder, 19. I doubled the range. Look, it's still 40%. It's still 20%. You need to know how rapidly things converge. Small examples can be quite misleading. Uh, can someone tell me what 16 over 64 is in lowest terms? One fourth. Uh, 19 over 95. Uh, 49 over 98. 12 over 24. Sorry? One fourth. Right? I, 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 I sent an email to you guys at 4 a.m. It, it was a long night preparing. I may be doing algebra wrong. I'm getting one fourth. All right. 16 over 64, cancel the sixes, you get one fourth. 19 over 95, cancel the nines, get one fifth. 49 over 98, cancel the nines, get four eighths, which reduces to one half. So 12 over 24, I mean, I've checked it three times. So you can ask, you know, for what other pairs of numbers would this hold? Probably not that many or I would have written more, or maybe I don't want to spend too much of class time on something like this. Just because you've checked something for a couple of small cases does not mean you really know what's going on. 
you can be misled by small data. This is not how you divide. Although I bet if I went into an elementary school class and was trying to teach kids math, I'm sure I could show them this and convince them to do division this way and just mess with their lives forever. <laughs> okay? So the question is, are there infinitely many primes and how rapidly do they grow? This is one of the big questions in the subject. And so what I want to do is I want to go to Euclid and give his proof of the infinitude of primes. It is probably the oldest proof that is still consistently used in math classes around the world. You know, the copyright has expired. We can all use it freely. We don't have to give them any royalties. It is a beautiful proof, and it illustrates a lot of wonderful ideas. So in the interests of understandability, I will not give it in the original Greek, and I will not give it in the more geometric flavoring he had back then. I will give it in the more algebraic flavoring that we're used to now. And it's extremely important to think about how you present material. Any physicists here, or, or physics majors? Oh. Oh well. Uh, the very f I have a son in fourth grade and a daughter in second grade. When I teach multivariable calculus, I often have the rare books library pull out some of the classic books in mathematical physics. And so the very first calculus book my daughter saw because she was sick that day was Principia, your first edition copy of Newton's great work. If you look at that, it does not look like a calculus book from today. It's extremely geometric in terms of how they do all the arguments. We do things much more algebraically now, which, not surprisingly, we now like because we've grown up doing things algebraically. So I'm going to present the argument more algebraically. It's a proof by contradiction. So assume not. And so let's say P1, P2, Pn are all the primes. There are no other primes in the universe other than these numbers. So in order to show that there is a contradiction, all we have to do is find a new prime or prove that a new prime exists. So the idea is consider x equals p1, p2 times pn plus 1. We know p1 equals 2. We know p2 equals 3. And we know there's at least two primes in the universe. So this number is going to be greater than 1. You know, I don't have to worry that this is the unit. What are the possibilities for x? What could be true about x? Right. Well, I, well, I want to know what are the possible what are the possibilities for x? What kind of number could x be? So x case one x is prime, and then case two x is composite. This case is quite easy to handle. I'm trying to show that this list is not complete. Here is a prime not on the list. So new prime, not in list, done. We got our contradiction, right? Now what about case two, where x is composite? All right, so if x is composite, am I still focused? All right. um, if x is composite, as was remarked, we just need to show that this somehow leads to the existence of a new prime. Can P1 divide X? Can, no, because if P1 divides this evenly, it leaves the remainder 1. P1 through Pn all leave a remainder of 1. Right? So, since this is composite, it must be divisible by a new prime. And that's a contradiction. 
Now what's interesting here is that we proved that there is a new prime, but we don't know what that new prime is. If there weren't a prime, there'd be a contradiction, so there must be a new prime, but we don't know where it is. How many of you have seen this argument before by Euclid? Okay. The next question is, how quickly does the sequence of primes grow? I'm not going to get into it now, but you can actually use Euclid's argument to get a sense of how rapidly the primes grow. Because we know there must be a prime between Pn and this huge product plus 1. You get an incredibly bad growth rate for the primes. You get something on the order of log log x, numbers up to x are prime. The true answer is about x over log x. It's not even close. It's horrible. But it does give you an infinite sequence of primes. It does give you a growth rate, a bad growth rate, but it gives you a growth rate. What I want to do, and then I'm going to switch to um, a different topic, thank you, is end with a nice twist. So it's called the Euclid Mullen sequence. All right, and then did I write them down? No, I didn't write them down, so I'll just go through a few of them. So Euclid says multiply all the primes, add one, and that'll either be prime or a new prime. So let's go through the process. The first number we get is two. All right, multiply all the primes and add one. What do we get? And that's prime. Multiply all the primes and add one. What do we get? Oh my. This is fascinating. What do you notice? What's happening when we do Euclid? You're getting all primes. So we said it may not give a prime. It may just give us a number that's divisible by a new prime, but it looks like it's always giving a prime. Oh, but maybe this is like the 16 over 64. Let's do another term. What happens if we multiply all the primes and add one? What do we get? Which is? So this should be a little bit less silly now than the 16 over 64. You know, the 16 over 64 should look quite silly. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think it always generates primes? How many people would like more data? So we could then multiply 43 times 42 and add 1 and see does the number divide that. And I believe if you do that, you will find that it's not prime. The pattern stops very quickly. And what the euclid mullen sequence is, is you go through the products and you take the smallest new prime that wasn't in your list. And that gives you a new sequence of primes. So the sequence of primes go 2, 3, 7, 43, and then I think some small number. The sequence goes up and down. You can have 20-digit you know, primes followed by a two-digit prime. We only know, I think, on the order of 40 terms of the sequence. It is an extremely hard sequence to calculate. But there's a lot of great questions. And what I want from this is, I want to start with something that I think a lot of you have seen before. You've seen primes. A lot of you have probably seen Euclid's proof of the infinitude of primes. Here's a nice twist. Can you use this to figure out how rapidly the primes are growing? Have you ever thought to ask this? If not, why not? What numbers does the sequence generate? If you haven't thought of this, why not? And again, it's so easy to get blinders on. I really want to get you to the point where you're asking questions. The more questions you ask, the more likely you are to ask a good question. You'll ask a lot of bad questions, but that's fine. It's finding those few nuggets. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on here with this sequence. And I'll post some stuff about this in the additional comments. All right, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to end with one of my favorite math results and a opportunity. If you can prove a certain thing which I would like, I will bump up your final grade for this course by one whole grade. That means if you have a B plus, you get bumped up to an A plus. Okay? That's how much I want to see a proof of this. And it may be doable. I have deliberately not thought about this for a while to leave this for this class. So I want to start with something that I think you've all seen. How many of you have seen adding integers or adding squares of integers and proving things by induction? You know, the sum of integers, sum of squares of integers. You might have seen this in a calculus class when you're trying to find area under curves. 
If you want to check the area under parabola, you have to sum squares. You sum like i squared over n squared. So what I want to do is the following formula. Let's let Sn be 1 plus 2 plus n. And I want to figure out what Sn is. There are a lot of ways to do this. The most common way people do this is proof by induction. And we'll do induction later in the semester. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the Gauss trick. How many of you have heard the story about Gauss with this? So you'll correct me if you've heard it slightly differently. The way I heard it is when he was five years old, his teacher was just having a bad day and didn't want to deal with the brats. So he told them, add up the numbers from 1 to 100. And was expecting to just have a couple of moments to just enjoy the silence. And then Gauss says, 5,050, almost immediately. And so the question is, how is he able to do this so quickly? Well, what Gauss noticed, and you know, this is the reason why he's Gauss, is just add the numbers in reverse order. What's 1 plus n? 2 plus n minus 1. So all of these terms are n plus 1. So twice Sn, how many times do we have n plus 1? n times. So we get twice Sn is n times n plus 1, or Sn is n, n plus 1 over 2. And there's a formula for sum of first powers. There is a formula for sum of squares. So if we let... There we go. Uh, so if we let maybe tn equal 1 squared plus 2 squared plus n squared, we get tn, there's a formula for that. I think it's n, n plus 1, I think 2n plus 1 over 6. And you should be able to get a rough sense of what the formula is like. The sum, you know, k goes from 1 to n of k squared, I should be able to approximate this with an integral. Yeah, well, roughly from 1 to n of t squared dt, which is roughly t cubed over 3 from 1 to n. So it's roughly n cubed over 3. So the main term here does look like n cubed over 3. It's a good, quick check. The next thing is I can check a couple of small values. You know, take n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, and see if this works. OK. Are we ready for the opportunity? So here is my question for you. Now, there are formulas to calculate the sum of the cubes, the fourth powers, and all that stuff as well. But these formulas become a little bit more involved. And the question is, is there a nice way to get them? I have no idea why it just turned to me. All right. So here is my question. Let's say you know what Sn is and Tn is. Let's say you know those two building blocks. Is it possible to get everything else in terms of them? And so here's an example. U, I think, is the next letter. Un is 1 cubed plus n cubed. I want to find a formula for that. And so I'm going to do the following. Let's look at Sn squared which is 1 plus 2 plus n squared, or the sum k goes from 1 to n of k. It's not that hard to calculate what the square of this is, because we've just calculated what it is. It's just n, n plus 1 over 2. So this is going to be n squared, n plus 1 squared over 4. OK? Let's look at this quantity here. Everybody remembers FOIL, first, outside, inside, last? All right. Now this is going to be a little bit longer FOIL because we have n terms. So I can write this as you know, a sum, k goes from 1 to n of k, and then a sum, l, goes from 1 to n of l. And there are two possibilities. When I multiply things together, I could have the same number twice. So I would get a square. Okay, So I would have you know, the sum, say i goes from 1 to n of i squared. That's when k equals l equals i. 
The other possibility is k and l could be two different numbers. I could have maybe 3 and 7, right? But if I have 3 and 7, I also have... What else do I have if I have 3 and 7? I have 7 and 3. So I can always assume that k is less than l when I have a cross term and just multiply by 2. So I have plus twice the sum i goes from something to n and then the sum j goes from something to n to something else of i j. I'm assuming i is less than j. Or do I want to do it this way? Sure, I'll do i is less than. Um, uh, let's do j is less than i. We'll assume j is less than i. So if j is less than i, what does j start with? What's the smallest number j could be? 1. And what's the largest number it could be? i minus 1. And what's the smallest number i could be? Ah, not 1. 2. Because we need to have i so small that we could have a j smaller. So, you know, check this formula if you're not convinced, but when you expand this out, it's the same as the following. It's the sum of i squared, and then it's the sum of twice this. Now, we actually know what the sum of i squared is. I haven't proved it to you, but I don't believe it's actually needed. All right? Let's look at this. I have a sum over i, a sum over j. Which sum would you rather do first, the i sum or the j sum? We've got a double sum. The bounds for the j sum depend on i. So I'd rather do the j sum first. This should remind you a little bit of calculus, of multivariable calculus. We're just doing things discreetly. All right, so it's the sum of i squared, i goes from 1 to n, plus twice the sum i goes from 2 to n. We pull out an i, and now we have a sum of j. j goes from 1 to i minus 1. All right. So now what we want to do is we want to evaluate that j sum. Uh, you'll let me know if it's, still, if it's somewhat focused down here. So how are we going to do this? Well, we have n squared, n plus 1 squared over 4 is the sum i goes from 1 to n of i squared plus twice, is this in focus? Thanks. Sum i goes from 2 to n. Now what's the sum of j? We're going from j goes from 1 to i minus 1. So the formula, we now use n equals i minus 1. So we would get i minus 1 times i over 2. That's just using a formula for the sum of the integers. Everybody comfortable? Well, now look at this. The 2 cancels the 2 down there. And there's an i over here that I forgot. And that's extremely... Okay, so we have an i cubed minus an i squared. Oh, life is good, right? We now have a sum, i goes from 1 to n of i squared, plus a sum, i goes from 2 to, well, could I make the sum start at 1 if I want? Yeah, I've got an i minus 1. I can have the sum start at 1 if I want, because that just adds in a term of 0. i goes from 1 to n of i cubed, minus a sum, i goes from 1 to n of i squared, the i squared sums now cancel. And you're left with the sum, i goes from 1 to n of i cubed, is equal to n squared, n plus 1 squared, over 4. We just got the sum of the cubes from Gauss's trick. So my question is, we actually really lucked out that we didn't need to know what the sum of i squared was for this problem. It miraculously canceled out. I'm going to risk asking if you remember your calculus. I know how dangerous this is. Do you remember sometimes when you integrate, you have an integral that you can't get exactly, but maybe if you integrate once or twice, you get it on both sides of the equation, but with different coefficients on both sides, and you can group together like the bring it over method, and then you can reduce that integral to something that you know. We're lucky here that it's a 1 and a negative 1 is the coefficients, and they perfectly cancel out. And we now have a formula. Interestingly, we don't need to know the sum of the squares. Is there a way to somehow get the sum of the squares from knowing this? Can we somehow go backwards? 
And my question for you and I will bump up your grade an entire level. Can we get all the sum of the powers from just knowing the sum of the squares and the sum of the first powers? Is there a nice, clean way? And so it has to be clean. It has to be a good way. But this is one of the things I love about number theory. There's a lot of very elementary questions I can ask that you've got the tools to start attacking. It comes down to, can you find good ways of looking at the algebra? And here, this is a really nice trick. This is using FOIL and saying, I'm going to group these things together as squares. And then I have the cross terms. Any stats people here? All right, so you might think of this in terms of the variance and the covariance terms. You know, it's an idea that exists in other places, which is one of the reasons I want to show this. All right, so this is a good place to stop for today. If you have any questions, you know, I'm happy to chat. Okay.